The Arctic is home to one of the most hostile environments on Earth. Yet it is here, in this seemingly barren and remote wilderness, that we are seeing the earliest and most extreme effects of global warming. The Arctic is the bellwether of change. There's a lot of talk about what that Arctic will look like in the future and what different countries' interests are in that changing Arctic. The sea ice in the Arctic is melting at a rate faster than has been predicted by scientists, and temperatures are warming. The changes that we've seen in the top of the planet in the polar ice cap have been far greater than uh, any models ever predicted. And that's scary because, you know, that, that ice is you know, some, something like 10 feet deep and takes millions of years to build up. So once it disappears in one year, it doesn't just come back the next year, even if it's cold. It's a thin veneer that comes back. But it creates opportunities. You've got countries that are looking at all of the natural resources that sit under the Arctic Ocean, uh, oil reserves, and, and it has become sort of, you know, the next big gold rush. Except it isn't gold that everyone's after. One of the world's largest oil platforms is being towed out to sea. Called the Priraj Lomnia, when it begins production, Russia will become the first country to drill for oil above the Arctic Circle. What's at stake is 13% of the world's undiscovered oil. For Russia, the world's largest exporter of oil, this is not a trivial resource. This is not the first time Russia claimed portions of the Arctic. In 2007, a Russian submarine planted a flag on the floor of the North Pole. Though dismissed as a publicity stunt, Russia was once again signaling its intent to exploit the resources of the Arctic. The Arctic is scary. People are looking at the oil reserves up there and saying, we want that. And it's gotten to such an extreme that leaked documents from the State Department through WikiLeaks indicated that the Russian government is thinking about militarizing the Arctic more and is saying that they aren't ruling out that there will be armed conflicts. In one of the most controversial WikiLeaks documents, a Russian diplomat declares, the 21st century will see a fight for resources and Russia should not be defeated in this fight. The leaked document quickly caught the attention of the news media. WikiLeaks cables seen by Newsnight show that behind the scenes, governments have been scrambling to carve up the Arctic's oil, gas, and other resources as they're uncovered by the rapidly retreating ice. Even Russia's English language television station carried the story. Despite Russia saying its interests in the Arctic are purely scientific and resources oriented, a defense ministry source claims the country plans to station troops there. Every Arctic nation, the United States, Canada, Norway, Denmark and Russia, has increased its military presence or carried out war games in the region. The United States takes its responsibilities as an Arctic nation very seriously. We will remain prepared to detect deter, prevent, and defeat threats to our homeland. And we will continue to exercise U.S. sovereignty in and around Alaska. We need to understand there's a new geostrategy, a new geopolitics of the Arctic that's going to emerge in the coming decades. The U.S. needs to understand its role in both protecting the fragile resources of the Arctic and understanding its geostrategic importance. Throughout human history, mankind is race to discover the next frontier. And time after time, discovery was swiftly followed by conflict. We cannot erase this history, but we can assure that history does not repeat itself in the Arctic. It remains to be seen whether or not there will be strife, or either political or worse, in the Arctic. Russia is behaving very imperialistically with respect to energy. They use it to dominate Eastern Europe. And uh, you could have strife in the Arctic of one kind or another. Though it is still too soon to predict conflict over the Arctic, the Prirash Lomnia continues its journey out to sea. The world is watching closely. So is an environmental organization called Greenpeace.
Aboard the Arctic Sunrise, a team of Greenpeace activists are getting ready for a nonviolent act of civil disobedience. Everyone knows the mission will be risky and dangerous. Their target is the Pirachlomnia. It is now the first drilling rig ever located above the Arctic Circle. When the crew maneuvers the ship to within a mile of the drilling platform, their action begins. The team deploys four inflatable Zodiacs. The plan is to board the oil platform and drop a banner protesting drilling in the Arctic and the burning of fossil fuels. Armed security guards are quick to respond. It doesn't take long before the confrontation escalates. The climbers are now caught in the crossfire. For hours, they managed to hold off the security forces. A Russian cruiser suddenly fires warning shots over the bow of the Arctic Sunrise. The captain issues an ultimatum. Arctic Sunrise, you stop your window or heave to. We are on a peaceful voyage in order to protest against the threat to the planet. The Russians respond with force. Armed commandos storm the ship and arrest the crew. The nonviolent protest comes to an end. But a question lingers. What compelled these activists to take such risks? To put their lives in jeopardy? And how is their protest connected to threats against our national security? This is what environmentalists fear about drilling in the Arctic. Harsh conditions like these will surely lead to a major oil spill and the remote location of the polar region makes it impossible to respond in time to prevent an ecological disaster. The Arctic is particularly challenging for any type of a contingency response. The first uh, problem is what I would call the tyranny of distance. Uh, if you look at the north slope of Alaska in relation to U.S. Uh, territory, uh, the nearest deep water ports that you can get to are close to a thousand miles away. You have the lack of infrastructure you have challenges related to communication and navigation. All those combined make it a very challenging environment. But for Greenpeace, the overriding issue is the world's continued reliance on fossil fuels, a finite resource that precipitated the melting of the Arctic. Sometimes problems become so great. Sometimes people need to stand up to say, we don't want the next war that our kids will die in to be over oil in the Arctic. We don't want our next war to be in Iraq over oil, or we don't want our kids to live in a world where they have to worry about extreme weather events, where they have to worry about the Midwest no longer being able to grow the grain that we all rely on. The problem with climate change is if we wait until we can see and feel and touch it, it may be too late. But we're smart people and we know this, and what we need to do is find the political will and the moral and ethical courage to take the steps that we can take today to begin to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions that cause this problem. If we reflect the real cost of sending carbon into the air through market mechanisms, uh, then we will uh, put less carbon in the air. We, we, we know that that's the case. 
But that's going to require a lot of conversation and global agreements that may be difficult to get to. For me, the critical way to motivate people on this issue is to present climate as a challenge, a life and a death challenge, to be sure, but also an incredible opportunity. And there are a lot of great ideas out there. There are good solutions to help people respond to climate change, to be more resistant to drought, to deal with uh, low rainfalls. The communities are ready. <laughs>